Okay, and the second one is Mark. And Mark was, was John Mark, um, possibly written uh, in the 50s to the early 60s. He's the same, and we mentioned earlier, the same John Mark that's mentioned in Acts 12.12. 12. And that Acts 12.25, he accompanied Barnabas and Saul. And in Acts 13, he leaves them and returns to Jerusalem, which caused the, the rift with um, Paul and Barnabas to where they separated. And here's... Uh, Arthur Pink, I, I, I searched him, and uh, Arthur Pink's a great writer. He's a dead writer, but he's still a, a great writer. Um, he took each one of the Gospels, and he wrote just a short caption for each one, and that's what I'm quoting here. Um, wh when it comes to Mark, he says, here we find Jesus as the servant. The servant of God. Okay. Servant of God. He says here in Mark we see Jesus as the servant of God. Although Jesus came as God to earth, he completely submitted himself to the will of the Father in heaven and took the form of a servant. Anything extraneous to that theme is excluded, which is why the narrative contains no references to Jesus' birth or youth. So there's another focus when when you're reading with Mark and, and one of the whatever you select is the one from Mark, you'll notice that his focus will be on a servant. Um, oftentimes Mark will um, take one of the rituals or the customs that the Jews partake would partake in and he will emphasize that in his um, writings. Uh, in 7, 2 through 4, he talks about the washing of the hands. And in 1542, he talks about the preparation day before the Sabbath. So he's, he's noticing these things about Jesus. The other thing I think on Mark, um, it's very likely that Mark wrote his uh, gospel to Gentiles in Rome. And he emphasized uh, persecution, martyrdom, which the, the Christians in Rome were quite familiar with. Um, he also takes a passage when he's saying that Jesus is in the Mount of Olives, where Jesus is there praying. And he points out that it is opposite the temple. Every Jew knew that. Every Jew would know that the temple was opposite the Mount of Olives. But Mark chooses to point that out because he's probably speaking to Gentiles and they're not familiar with Jerusalem. They're not familiar with the Mount of Olives. Every Jew had to go to Jerusalem at least once a year. So they would be familiar with all that. So Mark takes that opportunity to point these things out to them. Um, and in Mark 10, 45, he presents Jesus as the ideal servant when he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, plus, Mark, Mark, unlike Matthew, Matthew gave the genealogy back to David. Mark did not give a genealogy. Any guess why Mark would not give a genealogy? Yeah, he's writing to the Gentiles, but servants, you don't give a genealogy for servants. They're just servants. Whether who their mother and father was is not important. They're just servants. Right. Where a son of David, his genealogy is very important that it does go back to David. Where a servant of God, we, we don't need a genealogy. We don't need a title. We're just servants. And that's what Jesus was. All right? Any questions on Mark? All right, let's look at Luke. And we already said that Luke, Luke was Dr. Luke. Uh, Paul speaks of him in Colossians 4.14. And he calls him the beloved physician. 
uh, from that account in Acts 16, uh, Luke travels with Paul and even ends up with Paul in Rome when Paul's in prison there. Um, his gospel is the only gospel written by a Gentile. Luke's the only one of the writers that was not a Jew. Um, he traveled with Paul and he was also with Paul when he was in prison in Rome. Um, the recipient or who Luke was writing to was the most excellent Theopolis. Now, we don't know who he was. From that title, it sounds as if he may have been a Roman official, uh, someone in the upper standing in Rome. Um, and Luke is writing this account to him. And if you notice, this, this is the Gospel of Luke. When you get to Acts, he writes Acts to the same person. It, it came to me to reinvest all the, or look at all these things and re write the chronological order. Um, it could have been a Roman officer. It suggested that it was uh, written as early as the 50s um, and as late as the 70s to 80s. Okay, so for Luke's, Luke's uh, purpose of writing, Arthur Pink says to Luke, Jesus is Son of Man. So as you look there, you'll see how, how Jesus was portrayed that way. Luke says, it says to Luke, Jesus is the Son of Man, fully human, but unlike any other human being in his perfect submission to God's will. For this reason, Luke traces the genealogy back to Adam, the first human. So, genealogy of Matthew goes back to David, Actually, it goes back to Abraham, um, but his importance was the kingly line that the genealogy went back to David. Mark doesn't give a genealogy because it's not important who the servant's parents were, where they come from or anything. They're just a servant. We know Jesus was the Son of God, so we know his lineage, but Jesus' purpose was to be the servant. I came to serve, not to be served. And then Luke... His emphasis, son of man, his genealogy goes back to Adam. And when you look at those, you'll see that that genealogy goes all the way back. And we know Jesus' lineage goes back to the first man, first Adam. Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. He came to do what the first Adam did not do. And that was that's remained sinless. And then beyond that to be the sacrifice acceptable sacrifice. Um, Luke, also in Luke's writing, and, and this, this may be helpful for you in distinguishing the writers, Luke's approach or presentation of the gospel may well have been through the critical eye of a physician. When you start reading the account in Luke, you'll notice that there's details put in there that's not in the other writers. Um, he starts his gospel saying, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, this is Luke talking, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. So his purpose is to make sure everything is recorded in detail and in chronological order. So you'll find that in your account with Luke. So when you when you read your harmonies, keep that in mind. It, it might not be bad that, you know, have at least a little jot down of, okay, when I read the Matthew account, I want to remember Son of David. When I read Mark, I want to read remember Son of God. And I think that will help you see some things and God can reveal to you many things when we open ourselves up to that. Um, here's a quote. I, I don't, I'm not sure who I got this quote from. It says, It has been observed that preachers 
You usually see men at their best. You're always your best in front of your preacher, right? Most of us. Um, lawyers see men at their worst when they need legal assistance. Doctors see men as they really are. You know, if you go to a doctor and, and you hide your problems, you're not doing anybody any good. He needs to see you exactly how you are. And that's what Luke does in his accounts. And let me give you an example. Uh, in Mark 3, 1 uh, and Luke 6, 6. If you look at Mark 3, 1, the, Luke, um, Mark writes, and Jesus healed the man with a withered hand. When you read Luke's account, Luke identifies it was his right hand. So he goes into that detail a little more. I mean, hopefully when you go to the doctor and, and you need to have um, something removed, you hope he takes the right thing and the removes right it. Yeah, the right arm or the right leg or whatever. You know what they do now. Any, well, you've had, you got you got to draw an X where it is and put your initials and all kind of stuff on you. So make sure they don't take the wrong thing out. Go in for a apodectomy and end up getting your stomach clamped or something. Who knows? Um, another detailed account in Luke 22, 44, when he talks about Jesus in the garden, he describes him sweating as, as if there were great drops of blood. Very detailed uh, description of, um, of the accounts. So that's something that, that could be, you know, your whole paper can, you can pull out of Luke. The difference is Luke gives very detailed information. He gives a good chronological order of things. So, that, I mean, that could be your summation of the why you would pull Luke out as your, your writer that you want to write about or any of the others. And then the, the last one, um, John. John is the apostle. John uh, 13, 23, it describes John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, it's interesting, when you read the book of John, the name John is mentioned in there, but it's mentioned John the Baptist. In the first chapter, it talks about uh, John coming, preparing the way. That's John the Baptist. That's not the disciple John. He never mentions his name throughout the whole book. Uh, often he'll say, and Mary came and told two of the disciples, and they ran to the tomb, and he said, and the one disciple ran faster and got there first. He's talking about himself, because when you read some of the other accounts, it's John that was there first. So for some reason, he chooses not to identify himself as the writer, but in many of the cases, it's, it's pretty obvious that he's talking about himself. Um, he always calls himself the other apostle. When he's given an account of there being some apostles together, and he'll say, and the other apostles said whatever. Uh, the date, probably the, the late 80s, maybe 85 AD or later. Um, I know something is, something's interesting. When you, when you read the, the uh, historical part, and they give you the dates that these were written. Jesus died uh, about 26, 27 AD, because he was born maybe in 6, 6 to 4 BC. So it wasn't the year 33 when he died. It was a little earlier in the BC, if I'm doing my math right. But these, these Gospels weren't written, some of them, until 20 years later. So um, it's what did the church do for information? That, you know, they had some of the epistles. Where the epistles fell in line with the gospels, we'd have to look at that. But the early church were pretty much required to depend on the Holy Spirit to guide them. You know, we, we, hear, we hear churches say, we want to be a, a church like the church in the book of Acts. Well, to be a church like the book in Acts, or the church that was mentioned in the book of Acts, if we want to be like that, we have to be led by the Spirit, because that's what they depended on. They didn't have, they didn't have their Bible to do. Okay, so John. Okay, we got son of David, servant of God, son of man. Anybody want to guess what John's emphasis was? 
I mean, of man? Anybody? That was his emphasis. Uh, John, John's gospel, he didn't follow in a chronological order. He puts things wherever he wants to emphasize whatever he wants to emphasize. That's why these are the synoptic gospels. These are linked together with their stories and so forth. And John is always out here by himself. Um, Pink says, John presents Jesus as the son of God, fully divine. Jesus is not only flesh and bones, but he is also the creator of all things. And John says, in the beginning, uh, Jesus reveals his nature as I am, a title God gave him as his own. So John's emphasis, and he starts right out with it. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the, the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So it was in the beginning, Jesus. He starts right out with his emphasis that Jesus is God, Jesus is the Word, Jesus created all things. Son of God. God, but also Son of God. Can't be separated. The whole purpose of the Gospel of John was to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. And instead of giving the genealogy of Christ, John goes back into eternity to tell us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So John doesn't need a genealogy. He goes right back to the very beginning and and that's, that's the beginning for him. Um, John also writes, in, I think it's John 20, 30, 31. He says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Um, and that believing you may have life in his name. And in John 3, 16, we all know that. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that who shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Um, in the first chapter of John, these, this is kind of interesting, that all the things that he says in the first chapter. He says, he describes Jesus this way. In John 1, 14, the word who became flesh, Verse 29, he says, the Lamb of God. Verses 29, 34, and 45, he says, Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Joseph. And Nathaniel refers to him, again in, in John chapter 1, Son of God and the King of Israel. And then Jesus ends the chapter by referring to himself as the Son of Man. So all of those titles for Jesus are in the very first chapter of of John. He, he takes that point to emphasize. All right, guys? Those are your four Gospels. Now, what what do you need to know to take any of these and um, do your paper with? You have the concept of what I'm asking for, what I asked for earlier. Picking one of the writers and focusing on his part of that story three-part story, if you will, and write why you think he portrayed it the way he did, or what was his emphasis, or what things did he include in the story that maybe the other two writers didn't. All right? You guys got this down. You're ready to go. Ready to write your paper. You already started yours? Mine? No. <laughs> but I have an idea of what I want to write. I just need to put it together. And I, and I encourage you to do that. If you can do that this week, pick one of these. You, you're not going to have time to go through and pick five or six of them and read them and decide from that because then you're going to get so jumbled. Look at one, pray, ask God to show you one, select it, write it down, and you can start by finding 
the three accounts, cut and paste them to a paper or side by side so you can look at all of them, read them over and over till you get the full account of them, and then start your paper from there. Um, maybe you'll do, maybe you'll do um, something from Matthew. Say it's Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and it's a story. You write that story down. Then go into that story. You have it typed out on your paper. Or write it by hand if you want to do that. Then go in and, and start underlining some things that maybe are repeated in that story or something that, that jumps out at you. And then get the same account in Mark and lo look at the, the writings of Mark and say, oh, you know what? He used the same phrase that Matthew used. That's your similarity. That's the things that's similar. And once you get all three of them there and you do that, then you're going to be able to tell, okay, Luke didn't, Luke mentioned something the other two didn't. There's your differences. And then you write on the differences. You write on the similarities. You, you'll be surprised that you, you will fill up three pages rather quickly. It won't be hard. Now, I don't know if Sean mentions it on the paper or on the video, but in your introduction, what you're going to say is this paper is about three gospel accounts of the life of Jesus. In particular, we're going to focus on blah, 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 whatever account. Uh, I will point out the differences, the similarities, some of the meanings in it, and then I will show you why this writer wrote differently than the other two. That's, that's pretty much <coughs> your introduction. Don't, don't make it difficult. Say in there what you're going to give them underneath. And then do your three parts, or four parts. Similarities, differences, um, well, what is it, meaning, and application, or whatever it is that, that those parts you have to do. You're going to put those in there. And then in your conclusion, in your conclusion, you are going to summarize what you wrote in the middle section. Don't, don't put anything in your conclusion that's not in your summary of events. But sometimes you get down to the conclusion, you say, oh yeah, this is a good, I'll type this sentence in there. But if it's not in the previous context, then, then it doesn't belong in your uh, conclusion. Unless you want to go back and add it into your summary of things. So introduction tells you what you're going to say, the context is what you say, and the conclusion is saying what you said. I heard someone say that's what a preacher does. He tells you what he's going to say, he says it, and then he tells you what he said. Mm -hmm. And that's what a paper does. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to, going to write, I'm going to write it, and I'm going to tell you what I wrote. That's the basic outline of a paper. And then another additional page would be your sources, your last page. Keep your sources on a page all by themselves. Okay? Any other questions? Comments? ready to roll. Don't make it hard. Don't make it hard. And remember, I'm going to grade you based on you hitting those four or five topics. I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the content. I'm not going to crit critique, you know, your wording and so forth. But I'm going to see that you hit all the topics that I ask you to hit. That will, that will determine your grade. I've gone back and looked at some of my early papers. I was a little embarrassed, some of my early papers. Let me close in prayer. Father. <laughs>